Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Marion, and I'm the Director of International Education here at Paradise Valley Community College, and I'm also a sociology faculty member, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to our event this morning called Justice on Trial. Um, and we're going to start today with a welcome from Dr. Paul Dale, our college president, and then I'll do a little introduction of our guest speakers. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's kind of strange. I guess I'll stand behind the panel so I can be on the camera. But again, thank you, students, for being here today. I'm so pleased that Senators Boyer and, and Bowie can join us today. Um, as you'll hear, uh, Senator Boyer is an alum of Paradise Valley Community College. In fact, one of our former alumni of the year. So, so pleased you're with us today. Um, and if you're following at all what's happening in Arizona, this topic is so timely as it relates to negotiation and collaboration in terms of achieving justice. They're dealing with some very difficult issues and challenging issues in the, with the legislative process. So we're pleased that they're here. A couple quick thoughts, and I'll hand it back to Dr. Mary. And um, as you all know, too, part of the college's vision is this whole notion about positive social change, about making our communities better, our churches better, our businesses better, our neighborhoods better, and really how often involves dealing with controversy and controversy with civility. And I can't stress more how important it is to do that in a way that's collaborative and done through a negotiated process. And so, again, we hope when you leave the college, it's not just about having better understanding of a subject matter, but really trying to make a difference in, in perhaps reducing some of the isms of the world, racism, sexism, food insecurity, those kinds of things. And again, that's really difficult and challenging to do. Um, and I'd, I'd also be remiss, too, if I didn't remind everybody this is a great example of fair-minded critical thinking. So as you go through the process today, think about what it is to be a fair-minded critical thinker. Are you thinking as an independent person? Are you thinking with integrity? Are you thinking with empathy? Are you thinking with deep understanding? So again, this is a great way to see that in, in action. Um, I did reread re the, uh, the dialogue last night, and I, I, I told a professor here that I made the mistake of rereading while I was watching basketball, which you really can't do because this takes a lot of thought and effort, uh, but I was distracted by March Madness. <laughs> but I was really touched about this whole dialogue and really addressing the issue about how you have co collaboration and conversation when you're talking about justice and injustices, and when, especially when you're trying to resolve injustices. And I think you'll learn a lot from that today. So with that, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm going to join you all. If you don't mind me sitting, I look forward to the conversation. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Dr. Mary. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Paul. So um, on everybody's chair, I have the questions that um, our panelists will be addressing. But I want to introduce you to our panelists. And their bios are on actually the back here. So we're very, very <laughs> pleased to be able to welcome two Arizona State Senators, um, Sean Bowie and Paul Boyer, um, to the college, as well as two of our professors um, from the college. Um, so Sean Bowie um, is currently in his sixth year of um, representing Legislative District um, 18 in the State Senate. Um, and he is also one of the um, faculty members at ASU. So he's also a teacher. Um, he has a master's degree in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon University and is currently pursuing an executive MBA from the W.P. Carey um, School of Business at ASU. Um, Paul Boyer, um, I'm very pleased to say, is one of our professors um, and he is an alum of Paradise Valley Community College. So um, this is kind of the trajectory that many of you may actually um, pursue. Um, Paul is in his 10th year at the state legislature um, and these last four years as a state senator representing the Glendale and North Phoenix um, district. Um, he's taught literature for a number of years. Um, he's teaching communications for us here at the college. Um, and he too is pursuing a second master's degree um, and I'm very pleased to acknowledge that he passed his Greek exams um, last fall, which I got the email and I was very pleased <laughs> for him because I can't even imagine um, that undertaking. Um, but he is doing a um, master's degree in humanities from the University of Dallas um, and hopes to be completed um, by next summer. Um, Dr. Kelly Fitzsimmons Burton. Um, is our philosophy um, and, uh, and religious studies professor here at the college. Um, and she, too, is an alumni of the college. You seeing a theme here? <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's been teaching with us uh, full-time um, since 2003. 
Um, she is uh, quite accomplished. Um, she's finished several years ago um, her PhD um, at um, Faulkner University and has completed all the coursework for a PhD in religious studies at Arizona State University. Um, and then Michael Nashka, um, who um, many of you are his students, um, I'm very pleased to introduce. He's a professor of English um, here at the college. Um, he has a PhD um, from ASU um, in Renaissance English, um, and he and I actually hired in as full-time faculty. We are in our sixth year as full-time faculty, so he is, he's one of my peers um, here at the college. Um, and uh, he does some very, very interesting things and has, was taking students to a Shakespeare event a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our moderators, um, Kelly and Michael, and we will go from there. All right. Thank you. Well, um, you, all have the, you all have the questions in front of you. I have no idea where the conversation will go. But I can tell you where it's going to start. We'll start with number one. Um, gentlemen, I don't know which one of you wants to address it first, but um, when I was reading, I think for me it was very much trying to place a historical text like this in terms of cultural relevance now. So, I mean, obviously some of the footnotes here, like in terms of our current cancel culture moment or, you know, some of the issues with CRT um, or even notions of the justice system in America today, um, you know, I guess on one level it's why are we reading this? Yeah, so I think that, and it's always a great day when, in my opinion, when we can talk about a Socratic dialogue. So the Crito, it's, it's a dialogue not many people have read. I, I assume some of you have, which is fantastic, and that we're even able to talk about it today. I, I think it's important because I think what's in here are timeless truths. Hmm. I think there are some ideas in here that, that still resonate with us today, and that's why we're still talking about it. For example, what's the role of the majority? What good are they for? Should we listen to the majority, or should we maybe pursue a, a different path, or just something that maybe someone hasn't thought of? Uh, should one always obey uh, the laws, if, especially if one thinks that it's unjust? One could argue that Socrates, mm. just for setting up the context, he's just been convicted, and he's been sentenced to death for uh, what some would argue are trumped up charges, that he didn't believe in the gods of the state, and he was, um, what was it? What was the other charge? Corrupting the youth. Corrupting, corrupting the, the youth. youth. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And so here he is, though, his friend uh, who gets to the jail and says, hey, let's go. I've got uh, enough money to bribe the, the sycophants or the, uh, the informers. Let's get out of here. And he actually had the money because he's already bribed the, the guard to, to get in. That's why he was there so early. And he had the means, and Socrates now wants to persuade his good friend why uh, it, it's best to uh, honor a, a, a just contract. So all that to say, I, I think it's important because, of, yeah, some of these truths are, are things that, that we still wrestle with. Mm. Is it a just contract, though? That was the one, <laughs> that's right, you're laughing, but uh, that was the thing for me. Um, and I can't get a straight read, I can't get a straight read on on Socrates. Like, I don't know at times we kind of, we did, we did a little bit of a conversation before, but there's moments in here where I feel like he's, you know, being sarcastic or maybe tongue in cheek. I think he's pointing out, you know, some of the, the hypocrisy within the system, yet he is willing to die for his own, you know, for, for that cause, for the higher truth that he believes in. So that is certainly noble. Um, but I can't help but wonder if the people he's ultimately trying to persuade maybe with that argument will get it. Yeah, so th this is where Socrates embodies the laws, is that the laws are speaking to, to him and to Crito, where he says, uh, if, if, one was, if a private citizen was to nullify the laws at will, <clears throat> then doesn't that destroy the, 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 the city that one lives in? And so I do think that there's something to that. And so for an Athenian youth, right. they would have to take a test, uh, I believe around the age of 17 or 18, to see if they want to actually become an Athenian citizen. Right. And at any point, Socrates could have said, nope, I don't want to. I, I'd rather be a Thessalian or a Corinthian or, or somewhere, somewhere else, become right. a citizen somewhere else. He never left the city. Uh, he had family. He had children mm -hmm. there. He has a young uh, child right now. So in other words, the, the argument of the laws are, well, Socrates, you, you, you were raised under us. Your, your parents got married here. 
um, how could it be just by, by violating uh, the laws as we've set forth? I well, I feel like we're having the conversation. But I, so the interesting thing, you're going to jump in. I feel like this jump leads in. into my question. Good, go. Because we're talking about the arguments, but what are the arguments? So, and students, I want you to think about this too if you've read it. What are the arguments that Socrates presents and are they still sound? Are they sound at all? And I don't know, I, th I thought they were sound. I'm showing my bias. What arguments did Socrates present as reasons he should not uh, go against justice? You mean go against the the law. the law. The law. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't remember how it was translated here in the English. Was it capital L law? It probably was. Uh, um, you know, I don't remember. I mean, not that that's, you know, necessarily a sticking point, but well, I mean. He, he's saying uh, to this young man, if you can convince me otherwise, I'll go with you. Uh, and so he presents his case why he can't do that. So I was just wondering if we can talk about what is Socrates' case. Yeah, they are lowercase l. Okay. Lowercase l. Yeah, and that's it at 50, uh, 50 alpha or 50 a. Um, there, there's also another argument that Socrates provides, and that's the laws of the underworld, or in Hades, wouldn't right. accept him if he were to violate their cousins or you know, the laws, uh, the man-made laws here mm. uh, on Earth. And that's another thing that he's considering. He doesn't want to go before what he would, you know, consider, you know, the judge right. uh, with yeah. a guilty conscience. Yeah. Right. Which is interesting because the charges are, right, you've sort of corrupted the youth and moved them away from, to some degree, like our gods, right, if I'm remembering yeah. uh, that. But then he closes his argument with sort of an appeal to doing what's right by singular God, but God, mm. at least in this translation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, right, so... So there is that. Um, but I don't know. There's still that moment where, um, like, if, if the system itself was truly just, right? I mean, if we're going to, and I get where he's coming from, but if you're having these sort of, like, absolute, you know, moments, and you're like, I'm going to do what's absolutely right, virtuous, true, good. I will uphold the law even when the law is against me. Then... Well, how great is the system when clearly there's bribery everywhere, mm -hmm. right? There, I mean, there's so much wrong with the system, and yet he's still willing to die for it. It says a lot about him, mm -hmm. for sure. And I will grant you that, yes, he could have at any moment leave, he left, right? Yeah. He, could have, he, could have, he could have gone away. He could have chosen not to be an Athenian citizen. That is in here. Um, but if I read anachronistically, if I read as a modern, right, which I am, I also can't help but wonder um, how much that actually holds up. Because when Socrates is speaking for the state, he said, hey, we did all this. We trained you. We raised you up. You could have at any moment chosen to leave, right? You could have been a Thebian or whatever. You could have done these things. You chose to stay. Um, you could have just picked up and moved. How many of you can just pick up and move? What are you going to do for a job? Where are you going to go? Like, there's, there's some socioeconomic things that are throughout this text. It starts with money. Let's bribe some people. Right. And throughout this whole thing, it's like, man, you could leave any time you want. OK, where are you going to get a job? How are you going to make a living? What is your family going to do? Like, it's, it's great to say that on paper. Can you just pick up and move to any state? I can't. So there's that. I feel like I killed the room. But like there's that moment <laughs> I, where. I feel like there is another piece, though, and it's um, what he's been doing for 70 years. There's a context of mm. his life. I do think he yes. has been making arguments his whole life, and he's saying either you obey the law or you persuade otherwise, and I think he has been trying to persuade otherwise mm. all his life. No, I agree, and I think that's the moment where I think, I think he points out beautifully and rhetorically, right, just the brokenness of the system. Yeah. And then he says, but I'm still willing to die for this. I'm still willing to, to yield to this higher truth. And, of course, he believes, you know, in the afterlife and these other things. I mean, it's a lot, it would be a lot easier to have a different argument if you were, say, you know, atheist, if you weren't committed to feeling like there was going to be some form of judgment, right? But that's not where he's coming from. 
I mean, the, the, final, the final move by Plato here reminded me, there's a great piece by, Kelly will know this, but by Heidegger, uh, that, he, that was actually published after he died. Um, the rules were the interview couldn't be published until after the fact. It was in, uh, in the German uh, publication, Der Spiegel, but it's called Only a God Can Save Us. And it's very interesting that the guy who was gonna like trump all Western metaphysics and like deconstruct or destruct Western philosophy never got out of that camp and he still remained resolutely metaphysical and then by the time he's gonna die, he's still making these kind of arguments. Huh. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I mean, it's a bit more, um, one might even say like naturalistic. I mean, it's very concerned about like the environment and this notion of like spirit and other things. Not unlike what Plato's doing, right? Like this is not your sort of Western Christianity, um, right? Or, or anything Abrahamic. But, um, but there is a ring of truth here for sure. I just, I, I can't quite pin how I want to read Socrates here. I, I commend him for being willing to die for the cause. I can't help but wonder like being willing to die for a system that is in some ways rigged, but because you believe in the higher truth, is commendable. I wonder how many of the masses that they talk greatly about would actually understand the move that he made. Now remember, okay, so there are 500 jurors that voted to convict Socrates of death. He only lost, I think, 30 votes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it could, really could have went the other sure. way, and it didn't. So, yeah, okay, so in, in a society like this where maybe the system is broken or at least fragmented, mm -hmm. um, something that you had brought up, persuade or obey. So th those are the two options that Socrates presents to, to Crito, either persuade or obey. And I wondered, is there a third option or is that it? That's a good, good question. Is there a third option? Mm. Now we're gonna think and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to think about that. Yeah, That's a good as, question, though. as you're thinking about that, and th there was another argument, back to the earlier question that you had brought up. So wh what are some of the arguments that Socrates provides? And one of them was, what kind of existence would he live? Yes. Yeah. Now, remember, he's 70 years old. So it, it, for that day and age, I mean, that was, that was a, a healthy life. I mean, yes, he lived so a really yeah. long time. That was time. a ripe old age, yeah. yeah. He's probably not going to make it much longer anyways. So what kind of existence would he have if he breaks the laws, if he... Uh, either leaves his, his physical children in Athens, so he, he's exiled, in exile without them, probably will never see them again, given you can't just jump on Air France. And, right, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, and so, and he also has to be viewed with skepticism by everybody he comes into contact with. Like, hey, isn't that the guy that broke the law, mm -hmm. and, but yet he preached virtue his entire life? Yeah. Right? So what, what does that say about Socrates? Did he really mean it? Did he, um, what, was it all for show? Right. Yeah. So it's a matter of integrity. I thought of a third option, but I don't think he really has it, and that would be some kind of appeal. Mm. Is there an appeal process mm. for, for this? Yeah. But I, I don't think there is. Yeah, sadly, I don't know enough about the Athenian jury system, uh, judicial system, but yeah, I don't know that there was that option once it's been so. sentenced. Yeah, I think, I think when I think of the, the, the third option too, um, one of the texts that I love to give students because it's incredibly short but powerful, it's similar to Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, if you know that, mm -hmm. but this one is Ursula Le Guin because I love Ursula Le Guin and it's called The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas, yes. right? And it's fascinating, right? Because, and when I do it in class, so the gist is you have a perfect utopian society, which in and of itself is interesting because literally it means no place, but right, they live in this perfect place, but the condition is that there's one crippled child, right, that's malnourished, like they, all, the, all the horrible things you could, you know, language we would maybe use today to describe people um, who are disabled in some way. This kid's got it, and he's like in the basement and is starved and beaten and abused, and the deal is when you reach the age of reason in this, in this culture, in Omelas, you have to go see the kid, and then you decide, can you stay? Like, because the condition is to keep the society running perfectly you have to accept the fact that somebody has to be the scapegoat, that somebody has to suffer for your perfection, and then you can choose to stay or you can choose to leave. And because there's this, like, their law and their, I mean, for lack of a better word, there is no religion. Like, Le Guin is very clear in that, but it's, it's almost this religious conviction, right? There's a story, there's a myth. If you violate, if you even say one nice thing to the kid, you break our perfect society. Are you willing to damn everybody else's happiness because of your empathy? 
But the thing is, nobody ever tests it, right? And so like I'll have students debate and we'll do it and I'll have them split the room and you go, would you stay or would you go? And they, you know, they line up. And then I'm like, okay, convince the other side why you're right. And every now and then I'll get somebody who like, you know, is I guess a bit more contrarian like I am. And they say, well, why do I only have two choices? Both of these choices are terrible. Why can't I stay and point out the injustice? I'm like, I think that's the point, right? Like maybe, and I don't know, maybe that's partially what, what Socrates is doing. I mean, by being willing to die. The thing is, uh, and of course, you know, the nature of this being uh, a dialogue is that we get to read it, you know, millennia later and we get to, you know, to see the exchange. Um, but this was a very private conversation, you know, ostensibly, right, between two friends. So nobody else got to hear the persuasive logic of Socrates. He's just going to go die. And, I mean, to me, part of that is the tragedy. Yes, he, like, he's willing, you know, he has these amazing convictions, but had it not been captured by Plato, then he would have just been a guy that, you know, died for what he believes in, and maybe he would be, you know, a footnote in history. I mean, if, if Whitehead has the right of it, then, you know, all Western philosophy is a history of, or a series of footnotes to Plato. So maybe there's that. Yeah, but yet in, in Socrates' last words that, that we know of, I mean, other than the Phaedo, which is a recounting of his last day, but he spends his time uh, trying to persuade his friend to, to listen to him. And I just find that so endearing. I really do. I mean, he cares so much for his clearly, in my opinion, uh, <laughs> mistaken friend who, who has focused on the wrong priorities, who's focused on money and mm -hmm. um, reputation. Yes. He cares more what the majority think about him. And here Socrates is trying to, on, on his last, you know, second penultimate, maybe last, second to last day, uh, on why he uh, should obey the law and maybe mm -hmm. even become a better citizen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And live the good life. I yeah. mean, he's like the, not just the obeying the law, but he's the exemplar of the good life. And if he went against that whole way of life, it would be hypocrisy, right? Yeah, that's right. Is that good life, though, distinctly Athenian? No. Right? You don't think so? It's human. I mean, there's, I will grant you some of that. I will yield, <laughs> I will yield some of that, yes. Um, but there's also, I mean, as I'm reading and in my notes, right, I mean, the, the ultimate, at least in our version, you know, the, the translator says, hey, the, the big deal is that, his friend is trying to say, your options are essentially exile or death, right? And, and Socrates chooses death because exile would be horrible. And again, you know, he's 70 and, and there's all these things. But part of my note was like, well, is death better than exile? And then really to me, this is because your identity is so tied to where you're from, to your place. I mean, we, we know this. Um, well, I don't know. Arizona, Arizona is interesting to me because most people I meet are not from Arizona, right? We're all, we're all imports. Um, there are some native Phoenicians. I feel like y'all are unicorns, right? Um, but, but the thing is, you know, you're so deeply tied to where you're from. It shapes your identity. And while there are certain universal truths, this notion of what it means to be a citizen and what it means to do, like that is totally Athenian programming. Like that's what it is. Okay. I think you're right about the citizenship, but about the good life, I think there's something more universal and that's why the dialogues appeal to us, mm. because there's something in there for us, and that's this higher life. And then maybe that's the other option. It's not life, uh, physical life or physical death. There's a quality of life that Socrates was after, mm -hmm. and I think possibly achieved. Hmm. I mean, he definitely had a good run. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean. Right? I mean, until the end. And, and it says, at, and that the good life, the beautiful life, and the just life are the same. Yeah. Does that still hold or not? And he said, certainly it does. And so. What do you mean by uh, this is a human experience, not just an Athenian one? Well, I mean, the good, and I'm going to borrow from, from Aristotle a little bit, but the good for humans is based on human nature. And so if there's such a thing as human nature, then the good is for all humans. The good life is for all humans. And are they the same, the beautiful and the just as well? Um, I think they're interrelated. Yeah. But I do. The, I don't think you can separate them. There's always that stick. I love Aristotle, but there's also that sticking point about natural slavery. 
Oh. Right? Like, no, yeah, so you he's you wrong but, about a lot Well, of stuff. I know, but you can't be like, yes, good, virtuous beauty, but then yes, women are like kind of not really fully people sometimes, and other people are born naturally to be conditioned as slaves. Well, maybe like, that's the Athenian. It's to there it is, right? Again. Yes, totally. But we don't have to just say it's this or this. We can say there's this element of of their times, and then there's this element that's also universal. Oh, absolutely. And clearly finances doesn't necessarily get you there because this thing is so deeply entrenched and worried about that, right? Um, and that's the thing that, that Socrates is trying to convince his, his friend about in many other ways. Um, but, you know, he also, he's so smart and so old that, right, <laughs> I mean, he, he walks the poor guy, right, like right into <laughs> yes. essentially a rhetorical trap, right, because he's smarter than him. He's wise. Of course he is. Um, you know, and who knows how much of this is just Plato, right, being kind to his teacher, right? But um, I definitely think there, there are moments for us that are relevant. Um, but I don't know, like, I, 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 things that I didn't expect to find when I went back to reread um, were there again. Um, but I still can't shake the notion of whether or not um, enough people would get it. Not that it matters, right? I mean, if you're gonna die for what you believe, and what you believe is just right and true, then he's all in and I can certainly commend that. But if part of it was also to live a life as an example, and like this was the final teaching move, the final professorial move of like the genius, you know, philosopher who's gonna die by virtue or for virtue, um, how many people actually got it? In his day or the 2000 plus years yeah. since then? I mean, I suppose either, but I mean, that's, that's the, uh, I mean, I think we can definitely get things out of it today, but I mean, uh, I don't know that Socrates was thinking that far ahead. You know what I mean? Why not? I mean, maybe he was, I don't know. Um, but, but I do wonder, especially because so much of this was initially about the masses and the problems of, you know, mass thinking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and why that doesn't work how many people would actually get the message he was trying to convey as like maybe his ultimate last act. Like, would people get it? And like, you can't fully answer that. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's a bit of a moot point to even ask the question, but it's still there and it nags me. Well, what is the getting it? I mean, what, what ultimately does Socrates want? Yeah, well, that one, that one trips me up too, right? I mean, I still, I mean, I think to some degree he is holding to a much higher purpose and he's willing to die for that conviction. Um, but I also can't help but think that some of the discussion about, you know, the way that Athenian society works and all these choices that I've made and, you know, I feel like some of those moments are him pointing out the flaws and the hypocrisy within the system itself. I feel like he's being a little cheeky but maybe that's just the way I like to read him. Yeah, well, when he con c compares uh, the Athenian people to a sluggish horse, right. and he eats the gadfly, the, yeah. the, the massive fly that's it's annoying and, and arousing the, the Athenians from their slumber, I mean, he might be more than a little cheeky. And then when he, and, and this is back to the apology, if you've never read it, it's fantastic. So uh, back then, the, the convicted, they, they could say, okay, here's what my sentence shall be. So he, they said, okay, Socrates, what do you want your sentence to be? He said, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the victors in the Olympic Games, you think they make you happy, but I really make you happy. So I think I should be fed in the Pratanium or where the, the, the victors were fed. And, and this would be like the equivalent of, yeah, our Olympic victors or maybe like the Super Bowl winners. I mean, this is a big deal to win the Athenian Games. And to, to be fed just like they were and to be treated like royalty like they were, that, he said that should be his sentence. I think he was being a little cheeky there. Oh, sure. Um, I mean, I think the, the issue with any of these old texts, right, is that you, you can never fully know. I mean, there's always, uh, that's what makes these so rich and alive, right? I mean, you can debate them. There are certainly universal truths. There are, d there are deeper concepts. There are certainly, you know, religious notions or, you know, universal ideas in here. Um, and that's what makes them lasting. Um, but yeah, I can, and I think what's great is the ambiguity. Like, I can't get a full read. Uh, I don't know whether he's being sarcastic or whether he's playing it straight. And it doesn't necessarily matter because the point is, right, why we're here. It gives me the opportunity to think or to ask questions, to, to debate, to say, how is this even relevant to my life today, right? I mean, when you consider the 
numbers of like wrongly incarcerated people and other things, right? Like, um, and I don't have those stats, but the numbers seem to be, you know, mounting if, if some of the critics are correct. And then, you know, is it just then to die when the justice system can still be largely rigged, right? If you can totally get off if you have enough money. Like these are ancient problems that still perpetuate us today. And some of those things were what really, right, were, were calling out to me as I read it in my current cultural moment now. Can I piggyback on something yeah. you're both saying? It seems to me, when we asked the question, what was Socrates about? He was about the Socratic method. He was about critical thinking. And the fact that we're up here trying to figure things out, we can go, well, here's a guy that kind of gave us that model. Right. And I would say um, Socrates was about asking the hard questions. And if we're going to, I don't know, apply it today to things like cancel culture and critical race theory and justice in the United States, we have to ask the hard questions. We have to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. No, and I love the fact that, you know, he immediately is like, let's define the terms. Yeah. Right, because you have to do that. I mean, you know, yeah. this teaching any kind of like public speaking or anything, you need to define your terms because like we would maybe define justice differently. I guarantee you, none of us in this room is going to define justice the same. There might be similarities or freedom or law, right? Like those will be different. But we could do the Socrates thing yeah. and say, are you sure that's what it means? Absolutely. Because when I apply it here this way, it doesn't yeah. seem to be that. No, absolutely. Because I mean, so much of it, this is why I think so much argument, when you really want to get at things, some of the best philosophers were like really, I mean, like pseudo linguists, right? Like, let's go back to the language and figure out how we tried to capture this in language so that we could understand it. Like, what does this actually mean? And why do we, you know, why do we adhere to that? Like, what is law? Yeah. What is just? Is it just to be? Because I mean, again, they're like, you could have walked away at any time. Like, but could he though? Right, like on paper, yes, but could he though? Right, I mean, that in itself seems to have like, and, and I can't tell because he's totally speaking the way, right? Socrates is the mouthpiece for Athens in his own dialogue, right? He's, he's speaking for the state, capital S. Um, and I don't know whether he fully believes it or whether he's saying what he believes they will say. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And so... Um, while they may say, you could have left at any time. You could have taken your kids at any time and gone over here. You could have chosen to do this. Like, we can say the similar kind of things today in our own culture, but how easy is it to just pack up and move, right? And for me, it seems to go back to, you know, economic, like, you know, SES mobility, right? And clearly there's a factor of that in here because it starts with money. It's all about money for the longest time. Like, man, I can bribe you. I can get you out of here. Like, we can do this. And if it's not me, we can, like, this other schmo will pay for it. Like, we can, we can make this happen. Um, what are people going to think about me if you die? They're going to think I didn't step up and pay the, like, pay the bond, like, pay the bribe, really, not even a bond, right, to get you out of jail. Um, and at that point, it ceased to be about, I don't know, friendship, and it was about saving face. Oh, yeah. it was about, and it was about masculinity, right? It was about mm -hmm. gender. And I was like, whoa, all these things we don't want to talk about are right there in the margins of this ancient text. Because race, class, and gender are problems that never go away. They're as old as humanity. I can show it to you in Galatians, right? It's just funny, right? Like it's old, and yet there it is. And it's in here too. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely think it's relevant. I just can't ever get a read on the guy, like a straight read. But that's what makes it fun. Yeah. So if he's about the Socratic method, now we're obviously discussing it here, but did he succeed with Crito? Is he persuaded? I think in the end he's silenced. He doesn't uh -huh. have another objection. I think he, I think he did succeed. Yeah. I have nothing to say, Socrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he's silenced. He did, he's like, he may not, uh, he may not like it. Mm -hmm. He may not agree with everything, but he has no further objection. Yeah. So, in that sense, I think he was persuasive. I mean, I tried to find an objection. I want Socrates to live. I'm right. like, what's another argument we can give this guy? Maybe you can come up with one. I remember a conversation I was in, uh, a great books discussion over the apology, and uh, our professor asked, 
did he go about this argument the right way? Was there another way he could have dealt with this? And we were all just stunned, like, I don't know. Uh, I'll think about that for the rest of my life. Is there a way out for Socrates? I think if he wanted to live, he definitely could have gone about it a better way. Hmm. <laughs> well, if, if I may, let me try to connect this to modern day. I'll be more comfortable in that space. Um, you know, when I read this the other day, my first thought was, how many of our colleagues would have done the same thing as Socrates and chosen to, you know, stand with justice over their own self-interest? I don't think it would be that many. I don't know what Paul would do in that situation. Maybe we can ask him. But in looking at it today, I think it speaks to the importance of the work that we do at the legislature. You know, there's 30 of us in the Senate. We're two of them. We decide what the laws are. We decide what justice means. We decide what the laws are for sentencing guidelines for people who commit crimes and, and what those are. So it, it speaks to the importance of that work. <clears throat> I know when I think about things like the social contract, which is something that, that Hobbes wrote about and Rousseau wrote about. Uh, Rousseau, by the way, is Paul's favorite philosopher, if you ever <laughs> want to talk to him about it. Um, but it speaks to this idea of, you know, we go to the Senate every day and we obviously have our own beliefs about what's just and what the law should be. Our colleagues have other ideas and we debate, um, we fight it out and some days we win and some days we lose. And there have been days where, you know, bills pass that I think are really bad for the state. And I think Paul feels the same way. But at the end of the day, uh, the governor signs those bills, they become law, they're the laws of the land. And that, that's what democracy is. Um, and it's a responsibility that we take very, very seriously in knowing that we are the last backstop before this idea that someone had becomes law, uh, knowing full well that if we fail to stop it, uh, we all have to abide by those laws. So I think it is relevant to today when thinking about you know, what is justice and abiding by the laws that we have, that's democracy. And democracy is in many ways under threat, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, and it requires, I think, good people to be in that system, to be in elected government, so they can not just argue for what they think are just laws and, and stop those that are bad, but at the end of the day, be willing to abide by them, even if they don't like them, or even if the president or the governor is someone that they don't agree with politically or philosophically. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Sean and I are of different parties, but we actually we talk to each other all the time. <laughs> And we get along. Still we don't, possible, yeah. It is. And for the record, I despise yourself. I know. <laughs> but we, we don't always agree on, on policy, but Sean will come to my office. He's the only person at the Capitol, by the way, that can just come in without knocking. I still knock. But... He still knocks, yeah. And, and, and he'll give me thoughts that I, I, mean, I hadn't considered on, on certain bills. And we've killed a lot of bills, um, in fact, on, on the Senate board, because I thought they were bad policy. And... But Sean, so, so you're in the minority party, I'm in the majority party. Um, is it as simple as what's just is what's legal? I mean, we, like you said, I mean, we pass laws all the time and mm -hmm. you don't always agree with them. And mm -hmm. sometimes we pass laws that they go around me, I don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. is, is that what makes it just or is it something else? Well, technically, there may be cases where, you know, we pass laws all the time that aren't constitutional. Mm -hmm. And we have a justice system, we have a state Supreme Court, we have a U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, if it goes counter to the Constitution, those laws will get thrown out. I mean, we had part of our budget last year uh, thrown out because it was not constitutional. So there are checks in place. Uh, if you ask me whether I think it's just, I think my answer would be different from yours or any of our other 28 colleagues. Yeah. Now... It takes money, though, to go to court and to mm -hmm. challenge the constitutionality of something. Mm -hmm. So I've heard a former colleague of ours tell us that, well, we determine, we, the Rules Committee, we determine what's constitutional. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the, the bill gets out of the Rules Committee, and then it gets voted on, and typically, mm -hmm. not rubber stamped, but yeah. if the president wants it, it's going to go for the most yeah. part. Well, and what's really interesting is, you know, we had a talk at ASU last fall, and, and it was more about the kind of philosophy that I'm more comfortable with, which is the founding of the United States and the founding fathers and the Federalist Papers and all the debates that they had over the shape of the country. And if you go back and look at the debates they had then, they are very similar to the debates that we have today. I mean, you look at Hamilton and Jefferson, uh, there's been a musical about it, but uh, the disagreements that they had, I mean, you had Hamilton, Hamilton, for example, who was a very strong nationalist. 
and wanted a strong federal government. He thought that the federal government should have the power to nullify state laws at will. So say if Arizona passed a law that Congress didn't like, Congress would just say, nope, that's not in place anymore. Thomas Jefferson had the complete opposite view. He thought that states should have the power to nullify federal laws at will. So if Arizona didn't like a federal law, they could say, oh, we're just not going to abide by that. Right. So those debates have continued throughout the span of the country, and it speaks to this kind of philosophical view of what is just, what is the role of government, uh, and it's going to be a debate we're going to continue to have you know, for decades to come. So I thought of a third option. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> I don't think it's a good option. <laughs> uh, it, it comes up in book one of the Republic, and that's force. Mm. Mm. So Socrates, is he's in the Piraeus, which is a, it's the port city. He's trying to get back to Athens, and he's physically accosted. And they said, <clears throat> I think it was Glaucon who said, don't you see how many of us there are? Mm. <laughs> Meaning if you leave, we're going to prevent you physically from leaving. And so I wonder if if that's a third option, and back to the, our conversation, if we see that, that option a lot at the legislature. It's not persuasion sometimes, it's usually force. Whether that's, you won't get reelected if you s sponsor this bill, or if you vote for this, or you won't get campaign donations, or you know, whatever. What? Okay, so yeah. give us a scenario where force would be uh, applied in Socrates' situation. Oh, in Socrates' yeah. situation? So like, yeah. how does it work? Well, I, I think the they one in, in, in book one, I mean, <laughs> so eventually they persuaded him, yeah. right? They said, oh, well, there would be these horseback races with torches, and yeah. it's a novelty, and oh, there'll be lots of discussions we can talk throughout the night. And of course, Socrates wants to discuss. Yeah. And so that's what persuaded him ultimately to stay. And he's like, it looks like we have no choice. We have to stay. But I, I do think that, yeah, that, that ultimately... Uh, it, it is a good example, but also the force of the state. Mm -hmm. Well, and Paul, to bring up a relevant example that we dealt with last year, you know, we had the 2020 election, and uh, some folks were upset that they did not, did not win that election, uh, not just at the national level, but here in Arizona. And we were dealing with debates at the Capitol uh, about arresting the County Board of Supervisors, mm -hmm. and, and that would be a show of force, and you helped us with that, and, and that measure failed by one vote. If you had voted yes, then the Senate would have been allowed to just go and arrest yeah. the County Board of Supervisors. So I think that's a relevant example we can talk about. And I can give you another one, uh, breaking news. So Sean and I are working on a grand bargain <laughs> on education funding state on, budget. Yeah. for the state budget, yeah. um, what my party and the governor wants, which is a, a flat tax at 2.5% for, for everybody. And I think we can get there, but I was told uh, by a confidant that if I keep pushing this, all my bills are going to die in the house <laughs> by, by several members. And you, so that's... You get threatened every year. I do that. get threatened every year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that I was noting, you know, as the ideas come, is I think the beautiful way that at least our democratic system works is that you can still, you know, amend... You know, replace unjust laws, right? I mean, because I, I think, uh, you know, even in, in Socrates' time, like maybe there is, he's willing to die for the cause, but clearly there's some, some things where the system is flawed, right? You see it in, the, again, the notions to the bribery and everything else. But I can't help but go back and look, you know, since the opening question dealt with some of the things we're dealing with today, and you look at things like, you know, will, will legally tally slaves as not quite a whole person, but... Right. And then we get rid of that and we're like, oh, well, then we'll have, you know, Jim Crow and other things. Right. There's there's things that, you know, I think when a law is unjust, um, then you can you can push back. And what I would have liked to have seen and may, and I don't know, maybe Socrates felt like he was doing it in his own way was speaking to the injustice. Right. Because I think that's the that's the only way. Right. To affect change. Um, and I feel like so much of it, I granted this is totally also my wheelhouse, but how much of what we do is related to language, right? Is related to stories, they're powerful. That's, you know, how elections are won. That's how, you know, 
religious systems, philosophical systems, how all these things work is truly by the power of, of language and storytelling. I mean, the thing that crosses a threshold, if I don't like you, is when I sit down and get to know you and we like share our life stories, then maybe I start to see you as a person, right? Unless something else. And, um, you know. I'm wondering if maybe Socrates didn't do this, but Plato did. I feel like he did it for him, because yeah. Because mm-hmm. he gave us the stories. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think that to me is also what makes this, you know, definitely relevant and worth reading today. Um, because so many things are, I mean, I think much of the problem, one of my favorite uh, contemporary, I guess, thinkers who is both, you know, uh, a philosopher of sorts, a member of the British Parliament, a rabbi, like Jonathan Sachs, you know, is genius. Um, but what he pointed out at an ASU talk, right, like he had terminal cancer, didn't tell anybody, and like right before he died, um, one of the things that he mentioned was that the problem in the West, especially Britain and uh, in America, having taught at both, you know, UK and in New York, is that we don't have common narratives anymore. Like we don't have common stories. We can't talk to each other because we're so polarized and we're so divisive that we forgot the stories that used to unify us. We don't have it. And that's the thing we have to get back because if you can't get to a place where you are willing to see another person as a human being, where you're willing to find some sort of common ground, like whatever that common human, this is where we, we'll, we'll go round and round in conversations. I'm all for seeking the virtuous, the good, and the true, but I think before you can get somebody on your team to even try to do that, we have to be able to see each other as people and respect each other. That, to me, is like, you know, ground zero. Um, and, you know, I think, I think Plato helped us get there I don't think Socrates was able to do it on his own because, you know, obviously he wasn't writing the stuff down or doing those things. He didn't have the capacity to share his stories. In 70 years, he touched a whole lot of lives. Right. And he does sort of tell them in the apology, you, you're doing this to me, but beware because I have the students who have right. learned from me and they're going to come down on you harder than I would. So he kind of warns them. Um, the stories are told and will mm-hmm. continue. Yeah. And it will be worse for you yeah. than you ever imagined. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, and I think that goes back to one of my, my earlier things. Because as I read it, it's such, I mean, it goes back to the issue of exile. Socrates cannot imagine himself not as an Athenian. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. that is who I am. Right. Like, I mean, like if, if being American is in your blood, then to be somewhere else you can't imagine that because I'm American or I'm Phoenician or I'm, I don't know what you are, but whatever you are, right? Like that's, that's so core to who he is. But even when he's the mouthpiece for the state and he's saying all these things, I mean, he's, whether that was, you know, whether he believed it, whether it was indoctrination, like we can, we can debate that. But regardless, like he thinks as an Athenian, he well, is, yeah. it is the core of who he is. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. But, um, you know, and how much, I think for me, the, like so much of the, of the potential and the value here is to think about the narratives that we tell ourselves now, not only about ourselves, but about like this party or that party, or I don't like your, because we don't talk anymore, right? We just get in like, you know, social media echo chambers and fight and nobody's hearing anyone. Yeah. I think it goes back to what you were saying about the common narrative. It's almost like Uh, kind of fragmentation in our stories that yeah well like in preparing for this right I don't know if anyone knows who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was but he um, was uh, a theologian in in Germany and not not a fan of Hitler Uh, and he was caught up in, in a plot to take Hitler out and so he was put in a camp and I feel like a week or two weeks before right the allies come in and like liberate the camp Bonhoeffer was hanged so like he dies for his conviction but like these there are these letters from prison and other things Bonhoeffer is an interesting guy and one of the things that he mentions because so much for me in, in in this piece was that it's that we definitely have a sociological problem I feel like right like the the, the questions and the issues even the notions of justice and virtue are coming from a social concept right like it is even today all critical theory will argue Pick a branch. It's all going to argue that X is socially constructed, right? 
Like if it's gender, if it's feminism, gender is socially constructed, right? If it's critical race theory, um, which that is very controversial or post-colonial, then like race is socially constructed, right, et cetera. And it was all over this. Like all of these ideas are totally built on this Athenian, you know, this idea of how Athens conceives of itself. And Bonhoeffer from prison writes to a friend that stupidity is, more dangerous, is, a, is a more dangerous enemy of good than malice. And he's like, you can't talk to us. And he's like, and it keeps going, but he's like, against stupidity, we're defenseless. How do we do this? And what he points out is that it's, you gotta love him. The impression one gains, not so much that stupidity is a congenital defect, but that under certain circumstances, people are made stupid, or that they allow this to happen to them. And how does it happen? Well, he says, it would seem that stupidity is perhaps less psychological than a sociological problem, right? And what he starts to point, and again, this is the issue with Nazis, right? Mm -hmm. But you, you have perfectly reasonable, intelligent human beings that are willing to capitulate to horrible atrocities and effectively render themselves stupid. And he's like, and this is the dangerous thing. How do we, and I can't help, but there was, to me, there was a parallel even in Socrates' time, right? Like, he was on the right side of the law if you were truly going, you know, capital L, what is right, what is virtuous, what is just. Mm -hmm. And yet, it might have been a narrow margin, they still voted him down. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to die, right? And these were highly intelligent people making that decision. Mm -hmm. And yet, right, it didn't go in his favor because, uh, I mean, arguably, Bonhoeffer might say stupidity, right? The sort of willing, or Hannah Arendt would call this banality, right? The yeah. banality of evil. Yeah. This is the same thing that came up in the Eichmann trial. So what's the antidote to I don't stupid? Know. I don't know. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. Would that we could find that. I feel like I th we... I think it's this. I think, I think right. it's discussion and dialogue and what Socrates would call yep. dialectic. Mm. Yeah, I think so. But it's hard, right? It's the hard thing to have to think things through. Um, it's work, right? This is what students have to do. It, it is work. Uh, let me give you a, a very contemporary example. So back to the, the tax cut, um, the governor wants, he wants it to, we passed a tax package last year that based on certain economic conditions, um, the individual income tax will be phased down to 2.5%. Over, oh. the, the, assuming that we hit some economic conditions were above what the projections were. Sounds reasonable. Uh, the, my colleagues in the House and the Senate and the governor want to accelerate that and do it all this year. And I was just talking to Sean about this and I thought, have, has anyone done an economic analysis about this? The answer is no, we haven't. They wanted to go uh, today, which they didn't make the call for the special session because they don't have yeah. the votes right now. And I, I'm gonna insist on, I really think we need an economic analysis by at least one economist to say, you know, wh what does this put Arizona, you know, project out look, moving forward? We're at 10% inflation, the worst we've had in, since the 70s. Right. We are gonna have an economic downturn, there's no doubt about it in my mind. I'm not an economist, but right. I just think there's one coming and at least we should be uh, buffering for that. So you mean it takes more time to think things through? It, it does, <laughs> and, and the difficulty at the legislature is, um, I think they, we introduced collectively about 1,800 bills, something like that this year. Uh -huh. About 300, 350 usually get passed. Mm -hmm. And each bill, I mean, you could spend, you know, depending on the bill, you could spend a lot of time on. Right. So you're doing nothing but policy. Then they throw, you know, the, the, the budget at you and they say, you got to go now. And it, it doesn't really leave time for reflection. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's why I'm grateful for, yeah. for days like this where we can take a step back and, and maybe go beyond the hoi polloi, the, the majority, and yeah. just think through, is it, is it good policy? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I feel like that's yeah. the danger where we are now, just the speed. We're too fast. Yeah. Well, my personal favorite on the budget, we didn't, we haven't done this last year or two, but it used to be pretty standard is we're debating the budget, which is the bit largest thing that we do as a legislature. Our state budget is about $14 billion a year. Half of that funding goes to K-12. It funds our universities and prisons and roads. I mean, it, it's a lot. So it, re it should require a lot of due diligence and a lot of work and economic studies and all of that. But the way they used to do it is once they had the votes for it, it's like, all right, we're just going to keep going until yeah. we're done. Yeah. And it could be four o'clock on a Wednesday and we would be there until 6 a.m. the next morning. Oof. It's like, nope, we gotta keep going. We might lose votes. 
So we just got to run, run through the middle of the night. So we voted on budgets at 3 or 4 yeah. o'clock in the morning. I don't recommend that. That's, that's not healthy. Yeah, if they have 31 votes in the House and 16 in the Senate, they're going. doesn't matter wow. what time it is. Wow. <laughs> I want to go back to identity, though. Okay. So you're suggesting that you know, Socrates' identity was as an Athenian. Mm. But I wonder if there was a greater motivation for him. I wonder if it was piety or obedience to the God. Right? So the God said, you're the wisest, and I want you to examine everyone you, you meet to mm -hmm. see if they're wiser than you. And I just wonder if he couldn't have left for that reason. Because I'm sure he could have examined people in Thebes or Thessaly or whatever. Sure. But I think he was supposed to be there. I don't know. What, what do you think about that? I mean, it's certainly plausible. I, yeah. I think that, um, I mean, obviously, right, are we talking like sort of a state god? as in like, you know, Athenian? Are we talking about, uh, because obviously, you know, ancient Greece is very polytheistic, right? We're not, we're not dealing with sort of like, you know, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? Like this monotheistic notion. Um, so um, what, what is the higher power to whom, right, Socrates is beholden or is, is um, you know, is pledging his allegiance to? Because if it was, say, in an Abrahamic context, well, if all people are God's people, you can go anywhere. It doesn't necessarily need to be to this, to this group. Um, but, I mean, it, I, I definitely take the, I can see the religious nature of, of what he's doing. And ultimately, and this is where uh, Kelly and I definitely agree, and, and so much of our conversations will come back to, is that I don't know that you can ever debate justice or ethics without metaphysics. Yeah. I don't think you can get there without a metaphysical foundation. I think you have to have it. And we, you can pick your metaphysical system, right? But it can't, I don't think you can have a notion of something greater if all you are basing it on is like physical, tangible, only like the material reality world that we create, right? So like metaphysics just basically is like anything sort of beyond the physical, but think more like spiritual here, I guess is a way to okay. couch it. Can I bridge this discussion a little bit? Yeah. It seems like Socrates' metaphysical commitments may have been different than the Athenians. And that's why they're saying you're bringing in you're corrupting uh, the universe. Foreign gods. Yeah. False yeah. gods. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's uh, where he is differing from the uh, Athenian philosophical commitments. I don't even remember what the child, what, what was the corrupting thing? Do you, you probably the youth. The, you know, corrupting the youth and teaching strange gods. But what did gods that? not sanctioned by the state. I, I think but that, what does that mean? I think that meant his inner right. voice, his, his, his daimon that, right. that, that would tell him what not to do. It would never right. tell him what to do, but yeah. what not to do. Because um, those, are, those are convenient charges, but like, it's sort of like, you know, we're, we're going to go, you know, persecute one of the bishops in, in, in Massachusetts, right, and go burn a witch, right? You just, you just call them out. But like, what does it mean corrupting the youth and like false gods? You know what I mean? Because like, they never, I, and that was the thing about um, this particular moment in history. I, I don't feel like they ever fully defined it. I you read in that time period more than I do. It's a move away from tradition, I think. Mm-hmm. It yeah. seems to me that the, the parents were in charge of passing on the tradition to the children. Right. And Socrates is asking questions of the children. And maybe the children went home and asked questions of the parents. Hey, mom, dad, Socrates said this. And what do you think? And the parents are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Our authority is being questioned here. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a great, uh, well, any, honestly, anything by James Baldwin, read it because it'll blow your mind. Um, but there's a great uh, piece that he did, I want to say in 63 or 64, my students read it this semester, but it's called A Talk to Teachers. And he's really thinking about the nature of, you know, uh, where we were sort of civil rights era, right, like in America. But what he starts to point out is that so much of the problem um, of education is that we don't want an educated citizenry, right? Because what happens is when you're an educated citizen, you're dangerous because you ask questions. Mm. And this is Socrates' thing, right? Like he taught people to ask questions. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, when you get enough people around, from a religious context, it's easy. You can call it original sin or whatever, right? Um, uh, you know, Hobbes. Hobbes is a bit more, uh, you know, uh, worried, right, when you start reading Leviathan. Um, but ultimately, the gist is you put enough people in a room together, you got to find some way for them to get on and not kill each other. Because too many people is a mixture for some danger, right? So how are you going to manage that? And 
you know, I, I don't know. I think that um, this definitely starts to give us purchase to, to think through, you know, how we get there. Um, certainly debate and dialogue is, is necessary and is important. Um, but there does seem to be, you know, the fundamental flaw of like any kind of government is that corruption seems to be baked into the cake because people, right? Right. You, you, right? I mean, that's the thing. You can, you can have as much virtue and honor and dignity, justice. You can have all these capital T truths and ethics and all these things. <clears throat> but at some point, you have to negotiate that with a mass of people and people, which while they have a, an amazing capacity for good, can totally screw things up, right? And that history shows us this time and again. Right. And isn't this what the law is about? You have people, you have to have rules for living together. So, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Michael, how do you define corruption? I mean, is that self-interest? Is that advancing themselves? Is it advancing their district? Because we all represent different districts. Absolutely. And we come to the state capital, you know, each of us represents one thirtieth of the state. We obviously sure. have things in our district that we support uh, more than others. So how would you define that? In a, in a modern context? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I think on one level, if you're thinking self-interest over collective good, that's probably a good place to start. Um, I mean, not, not being, you know, in the Senate or the House myself, I, I can't help but wonder the sheer length of these things that you have to read and like, I mean, I know certainly even at the national level, right, like things just get buried in these ridiculously long bills because the idea is nobody's going to read it. Yeah. And so things that shouldn't be in there are in there because of special interests and other things. That seems to me to be like nicely labeled corruption. Maybe it's something else. But even in the sense of like something that is corrupt taints what, what, what the original intent was. Like, you know, if, if we're talking about I don't know. Um, what was the thing recently? Didn't, the, didn't part of the budget get voted down because something else was in there that oh, wasn't yeah. quite budget related? Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, it's like, why is that there? I mean, if the whole point is to be completely transparent, completely open and honest so that we can make the right choice, but then 400 pages in, something gets hidden in a subclause, why? Well, because you know how the system works and you know nobody's going to read all that. And so I don't even know how you catch it. Like, do you like machine read it? How do you catch all that? Like, that is so fast. We have speed readers. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, so any, any new changes, it's all in capital letters and it's usually in blue, mm. at least on the computer. So, but sometimes when you read it, you still don't understand, okay, what's this trying to fix? Uh -huh. yeah. or, or one letter could change one non or no, could change the entirety of the meaning. Right, so it's back to a language problem, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So... Yeah, I, I, don't, I, think, I do think that part of the, you know, the open dialogue, the discussion, the willingness to come together and do the tough thinking is the place to begin. Can I take a shot at what Sean was asking about corruption? If we go back to Socrates, he's talking about the good life. So it seems like whatever's opposite the good life would be corruption, in the dialogue at least. And it seems like the good life is what is a source of unity for a people group. So we have to agree, yes, we think this is the good life and, and our laws are for preserving that and we're living together with that in mind. Corruption would be whatever is mm. against that. But isn't that socially constructed? It's either socially constructed or rationally constructed. Mm. I'll let you figure, figure right. out how you want to do it. Because again, right, if you're, if you're in this like, sort of ancient Greek, and again, the ancient world was rife with, with these kind of issues um, and slavery then was different than slavery now, but even just make a case of that in our current moment, um, where was the eudaimonic life for the slave, right? I mean, you can, that, that's the well, thing, that's the sticking point. I hear you, her, right? I hear you socially, but as a human being, can the slave find the good? Let's say the slave heard Socrates talking. Could they listen and apply themselves and say, you know what, this slave life is not, it's not right, it's wrong, and I'm gonna give a counter argument. To slavery, I, even though I am a slave. I think Socrates helps with this. So, so back to the text. So Crito is talking to Socrates about, um, I, I want you to be saved. And I think he means by s salvation or being saved different than what Socrates means. I think right. he means by physical yeah. Yeah, the preservation. Body. Yes. Yeah. So then Socrates says, 
would that, and, and there, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. So Crado says we, we should care what the majority think because they, they're capable of the greatest of evils. Right. And Socrates says, would that they were, because if they were capable of the greatest evils, they'd also be capable of the greatest good. Yeah. But as of right now, they do things haphazardly yeah. or randomly, and they can't make a man either wise or foolish. Right. And so I think what that suggests, and I, I don't know enough about the, the slavery situation in Athens, but that for Socrates at least, even if they kill him, that's still not the greatest of evils. Yeah. Because for him, I think the converse, of course, of, of uh, foolishness is, is wisdom. Yeah. And they can't take that from him, no yep. matter what they do to him, physically or otherwise. True. Yeah. No. And, I, and again, like that is absolutely noble. But there, there are these still the, there are these moments when if you are in a, a position of like complete and utter subjugation, and that was not the case of all slavery in ancient Greece. But I mean, if you take it in sort of an American plantation context, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's wonderful to sort of wax poetic about higher virtues when that is the very real condition of your existence, mm -hmm. you know. And the same people, oftentimes, hip hypocritically, right, are going to argue for that institution, will do it with the Bible, will do it with a religious text mm -hmm. that in no way should sanction that, but they can twist it and do these things, not okay. unlike the law and other things can be twisted in the Socratic I context. I fully agree with you, and I think this comes back to the value of Socrates. That we can call it out as, as mm -hmm. unjust and argue against it yes. is, again, what he would equip us to do. Right? Yeah. I mean, no. That we can say that was wrong and it should never happen to a human being Get, is, because we ha have the capacity to argue about that. We can recognize assumptions and recognize uh, where critical thinking isn't happening. Right. I mean, I think that's the, that's the, the ultimate moment, right? I think that's a burden that yeah. we have as like so-called critical thinkers, right? Absolutely. I think, I think the, the next move, which is all, I love the debates, and then the thing becomes, how do you move from philosophy to praxis? How does it go from let's talk about it to like the rubber can actually meet the road and we can actually make this thing happen? Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of historical examples of where it does, but I think that's obviously, you know, much like anyone who's in a recovery program, right? You have to first admit that there's a problem, yep. right? You have to own it, work through those steps, think about it, talk about it, and then start to figure out a path moving forward. And right. I think, right, I think honestly this is fantastic because the more voices at the table, the better, right? The more opinions, the more diversity. That's a buzzword we love to throw around, but oftentimes diversity is not as diverse as it should be, right? And so much of that is we need more perspectives because people will show you things. Their narratives are different, right? And so they help you see things that your blinders don't show you because you don't know what you don't know because you haven't lived that experience. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I've never been an ancient Greek, but right, this is, it's, it's fantastic to have that you know, opportunity to see that even thousands of years ago, the same problems, the same problems that we face today, which means we still have work to do. Yes, we do. Dialogue, but I just do, I want you to be aware that our legislature, there's really not a super majority. It's almost like one vote can trip one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And the party that has power defines public good and justice for our state. And so that's why it's important you all vote in terms of supporting that. So I guess my question to the two senators real quickly is, you know, the, the crux of this article is about dialogue, about having a conversation about difficult things. And so if one party can define public good or justice by just one vote, right, in many cases, is there dialogue and debate that really occurs that's authentic and genuine to try to persuade them? Um, because you know, my welfare is defined by a, a really kind of, in some cases, just one vote in the legislature. So does this, yeah. is there a space for that? And is it, is it authentic, going back to what, what our faculty said? You're the majority, so I'll let you start. There's <laughs> not enough of it, I will say that. Even, even within the majority party, I will tell you, there's not enough authentic debate. I, I wish there was more of it. It, a lot of it feels like you're a part of the, the whatever party you happen to be a part of, and, and Sean can speak to his party, but for my party, uh, it, it, the way it works in practice is you're expected, no matter what it is, to toe the party line. And that's why there was such anger at me when we ended up killing, what was it, 14 bills on the board last one week? One day. Yeah. In one day. <laughs> 
and, and they, were, they were outraged that, that I would vote no on all these bills, and I just said, it's bad policy. It's not workable. And these were all, mostly election bills. And, and they were terrible bills, and, and, and they couldn't be implemented properly by the professionals, by the people that have done this for decades. There's never been a problem. All of a sudden, you know, there's all these massive problems that aren't really there. And, but to your point, yeah, there's, there's not enough. So that's when I think, at least in our modern society, that's when I think it's critical to go to the media and to call it out and to sunshine is the best disinfectant. I would say yes, being in the minority, there's not enough. Um, uh, certainly, certainly in my party, there's, you know, we often feel neglected and we feel that you know, we're not included and our votes are never really um, desired unless they're needed. And I'm someone who works with everybody. I've been named the most bipartisan member of the Senate. So I try to work well with both Democrats and Republicans. And there have been often times where I will say, I want to be included, include me. And often I am not, just because I'm in the minority. And the thought, like Paul said, is you're one of 16. You're supposed to be on the team. You're supposed to vote for this. So I feel like it's gotten worse over time. I'm in my sixth year. And I know when I started, we had more members who were like that. And uh, there are fewer, and, and the two of us are not running for re-election, spoiler alert. Um, and I think part of that was the frustration with there not being enough dialogue and there not being enough bipartisanship uh, at the legislature. Which is why I'm bringing Sean to our budget meeting today with leadership. <laughs> <laughs> no one's watching this, right? OK, good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start? I don't know if we have enough time. Um, <laughs> it was a very difficult decision for me. Uh, I made my decision last September. I love my job. Uh, I love working on policy. I, I love um, being in the room to make these decisions. It's what I enjoy doing. Um, it's a very significant sacrifice uh, running for office and being elected. It takes up a lot of your time. And part of it was, like I just said, a frustration with uh, there being less bipartisanship, um, but a lot of it is it's not very sustainable to do it for a long period of time uh, given the demands that are on you and the desire to have a life outside of that. So if we had another hour and 15 minutes, I can go into full detail, yeah. but that's kind of my short answer. For, for me, it's been 10 years as an elected official, and uh, I needed a political Sabbath. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. It puts a lot more burden on the individual who's trying to do that. And so there is a, a council member, Jim Waring. He, he's infamous for knocking on doors. Every time I talk to Jim in the afternoon, he's calling me. He's just either got done knocking on doors. <laughs> and so he connects with his constituency on a daily, literally on a daily basis. But it puts a lot of work on the member who you have to know the policy. You speak to the policy. You explain your votes uh, publicly and in, in, in caucus. But you also, yeah, to, to focus on re-election, no matter what they say about you, you have to have a connection, a personal connection. It's just, it's a lot more work. It's at $12 an hour. Uh, that's what, what we make because we the voters set our salaries. That. We make less than that. <laughs> Maybe it's less than that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, as Sean said, it's a, it's a huge commitment. But for me, what, what kept me coming back is there's only a certain amount of good that I can do here that I couldn't do anywhere else. And, but, but yeah, it's it's time for, for someone else to pick yeah. that up at this point. I would agree with a lot of that. And I wanted to make this point earlier. When folks run for office and they get elected, it's not just about what you think is just or good, but it's also trying to assess what your district thinks is good or just. Yeah. And for me, I'm in my sixth year. I've won by a bigger margin every time. I get flagged from folks in my own party all the time, almost daily, just like Paul does. And my response is usually, I grew up in my district. I know what I'm doing. I, I've grown up there. I've gone to public schools there. I knock on doors all the time. My first election, I knocked on 15,000 doors. I have a pretty good sense of what they're looking for. So even if it means I have to vote against the party, 
I can explain it when I go back into my district. And if I get grief about it, I can say, well, here's what I was thinking, and I was thinking about this school or, or this business or this community group, and I can sell it. So at the end of the day, for me, it's never been about what's best for party. It's about what's best for my district, because those are the folks that I'm likely to represent. I'm a Democrat, but I also represent independents, Republicans, libertarians. That's something I try to think about with every vote that I make. Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. I feel like Socrates was the first cancel culture, and he got canceled big time. <laughs> but I think his argument still stands. Um, I think he wants, uh, he wants his students, I, I don't think he'd call them his students, but his students to think for themselves, to ask the hard questions. And when you do that, you might go against the majority, and it's maybe uncomfortable and hard, but he thinks you're going to gain something better than approval of the crowd. You're going to get the good life. And that's the life that brings meaning and uh, happiness. So is it better, I mean, maybe if we say the good is to get honor from our peers or um, fame on the internet, if we think that is the good, then what Socrates is suggesting is not gonna work for us, right? But he's saying, what is the good? Think about it. What is of highest value? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, and in book two of the Republic, there's, there's a discussion about there, there, there are goods that are good for their own sake, for the consequences or what comes out of it. And then there are some goods that it's like drudgery, if you will. You, know, you, you practice virtue so you could um, get either you know, honor or favor or maybe even social media you know, likes or whatever. But I think what Socrates would argue, no matter what the public perception is, that there is a, a good living the just life in and of itself, even if nobody ever recognizes you for it, there, it, it it's a good that, that um, I don't know, I guess it, maybe it helps you sleep at night a lot easier than the person who is only doing it for, for accolades or, or, or social media or, or whatever. Yeah. Some stories on that. That it's valid to not care about the majority, or is it like, do you still think that Socrates' argument is essential into not giving in to um, a lack of privacy? You, you, you could talk about that. Right? Yeah, so I do think that when I present something, if I have a conviction that this is the best policy, I don't care if the governor's staff is mad at me, or my leadership is mad at me, or, or, or I'm the only no vote on a particular issue. But if, if I've reasoned through and thought through the issue, and, and I know with conviction that I'm doing what's best for the state, then I can take all of it, and they can say whatever things they want about me, and there might be a public narrative that, well, like last year, uh, when I voted no on uh, jailing the, the county board of supervisors for following the law, but there's a narrative out there that, well, I, I was for a fraudulent election, and I didn't care about election integrity, and at least with my party, the, the loud folks in my party, and, and granted, it was difficult. Um, my wife and I, we had to leave our home for a few nights and take our, our young son with us, and that was, that was unsettling. Uh, I'd do it again, though, because it was the right thing to do, and I, I'd vote the same way uh, because it was the right thing to do. And so 
I, I guess you, you get to the point where you, it, it still bothers you, but you can't care because our focus is on, well, what's good policy for the state? You have to have a very thick skin to be in politics. I, I remember my first year, again, I was getting a lot of grief um, even then. And one thing I learned in my first year is, you know, people have different perspectives. They come from different backgrounds. With a lot of folks, there is nothing that you can say to them to convince them to agree with your line of thinking. You could have the most logical argument in the world. They just have different backgrounds, different experiences. Some people will just disagree with you. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a very important lesson to today where Paul particularly gets a lot of grief. Just look at his Twitter account. Um, <laughs> Former President of the United States has attacked him how many times? Three times. Three times. <laughs> Called him nothing but trouble and so on. So you have to have a very thick skin. And, but again, it speaks to the importance of the work that we do. And it's something we take very, very seriously. We decide what the laws are for the state. We decide how $14 billion of taxpayer money gets spent. So it's, it's just part of the process. and something you have to mentally prepare yourself for if you're going to go into this. I do. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.